Okay, at six thirty. I will call the uh, January twenty twenty three um, meeting of the Woodstock Economic Development Commission to order. Um, the second item on on the agenda is additions or deletions to the agenda. Do I hear anything from anybody? Hearing not, I would assume that uh, the agenda is well as intact. The third item is approval of minutes from December 1st. Before you get, do we have a quorum? Do we have a quorum? Yes. We have seven. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry. Just one so, second. thank you. So, mm -hmm. the third item is approval of minutes from December 1st, 2022. I will move that we approve the minutes from both December 1st and December 15th, which are posted on the website in the meeting. So, there's a motion. Anybody second it? Second. Second. We have a motion and second it that we approve the minutes uh, from December 1st and December 15th of 2022. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. So fourth item, citizens comments. This is the uh, time of the meeting where anybody can just pop in and, and uh, voice an opinion or comment. Anybody want to raise their hand? Hello? Apparently not. So the fifth item is old business. We're going to start with the working groups. The first one is the housing, uh, the housing group. Uh, well, I that, can't. Uh... Wait a minute. And that uh, is going to be combined, as I understand it, with the um, item 6A, uh, housing applications. So who is going to speak for the housing group? Is that you, Jill? Yes. Jill Davies? So I will speak and Trina will speak. Yes, and me, go Trina. Ahead. And yes, go ahead, please. So we have one new application to discuss. Okay. Discuss that first, and then we want to talk to you about the ideas we've been having for the 2023 application, and we'll talk you through those to give you an opportunity to ask lots of questions. Okay, and Jill, I have the documents here, so you can just tell me when you want to go for them. Okay, fine. So okay. Could you start with Trina's uh, piece of a new application? Yes. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm here to present Lori Marshall's ADE Workforce Rental Program application. Um, she is uh, has applied to the ADU um, Rental Incentive Program, which is a $10,000 grant. Um, the home itself is located at 569 Lincoln Street, I've provided some pictures here, um, and it is a house with a private entrance to a apartment that's on the back side uh, to the right. Um, <clears throat> it's in need of uh, a lot of work. They've gutted it out. Uh, they've been doing some foundation work on it already so that it can be permit ready for rental. Uh, Trina, she, is, this the one we, is this the one we saw previously? Um, I don't know if, well, you know, uh, Patrick, I think it was in November that the housing group approved this, but we didn't have a December meeting, so it's just now getting presented to the EDC. That's, that's, what, that's why I'm recognizing it. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, anyway, I've done a site visit, and I've taken some pictures of the work that they're doing. Um, it is an existing structure. It's a mother-in-law apartment um, and it's been totally gutted. Uh, they've been working on the foundation and she's also applied for the state VHIP program as well. Um, if approved, the ADU uh, program funds for 2022 um, have been exhausted with, for the three new applicants that we could accept. This is the third one. So here tonight to request approval of the grant for Lori's project. And if you want to scroll down, you can see the other pictures of the work they're doing. Great. Thank you. Um, so as I understand, you, you want approval of $10,000 to continue this work. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? 
one of the thoughts I have is ten thousand dollars doesn't go very far, you know, when renovating your house. Um, is that is that going to complete it? I doubt it. Is it? Is it? Oh no no no. Um, no she's I also so. yeah she's applied to the state VHIP program as well, and that uh -huh. could qualify her up to fifty thousand with the state. In okay. addition, the state's also released a healthy homes initiative, which could allow. I believe it's up to thirty thousand for energy efficient additions and plumbing and heating and that type of thing that they could she can also apply for. Right, great. Okay, thanks, John. Did you have a question? Yeah, two two questions. One is uh, Trina. I assume because you didn't mention it at all, which I assume that you've that she meets the requirements for rent and that you know all of the other various things and so forth. She meets all the yes, requirements. yes. I apologize. Yes, she meets all of the eligibility requirements. Uh, she submitted an application and signed it, and she's aware of the qualified tenant requirements that we have and the rental requirements once the unit is completed. Yeah, okay. And, and she has a tenant sort of lined up, right? No, uh, actually, yes, Lori does. Um, I believe she may be using a contractor that she's using to actually build it. So it'll be nice to have another contractor in the area. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so I guess we're ready for a vote. I make a motion that we approve her uh, application. Second. I have a motion to approve the application and second it. And yet for the discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Grant approved. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Appreciate You're it. Welcome. Okay, can get to the general. So now we're going to work, work move forward to the presentation from the housing working group. There's several of us here tonight. Um, Deborah, Patrick, and Marion work on this committee or a group. Sally is here. Uh, Cliff is here. Trina is the housing advisor, and and I'm on that group too. So. It's, uh, Greg Olmsted is also on the group, but he's not here tonight. So we're going to take you through the results that we've been able to accomplish since we got the grant earlier in 2022 and talk to you about ideas for 2023 and what our thinking is now. And what we'd like to do is have you ask lots of questions so that we can um, get your thoughts and ideas before we make this into a formal proposal. So next one. So we'll start with our with what went on in 2022, then we'll go on to 2023. So we were awarded 93,000 in grants in 2022. We had two programs in mind, the ADU Workforce Rental Pilot Program and the Rental Incentive Pilot Program and to recruit a housing advisor who is Trina. <laughs> and in the 10 months since we started, we've created five housing units. Jill, does that include the one we just did? Yes, we assumed that you were going to prove it. So we counted it. So three ADU and two short-term rental, three, three rental incentives. Three right. ADU and two rental incentives. And we'll talk to you more about that. Correct. So we set out in 2022 with the idea of increasing workforce housing, and we want to continue that in 2023, um, but we want to do it through both rentals and start exploring home ownership. So next slide. So these are the details of the five units we've uh, created so far. So Trina, do you want to go through the details of this? Yes. So. Um... Since uh, the pilot began, we've got three ADU workforce uh, rental pilots. One is a one bedroom that's under construction. We have another one that is a studio that's planned for the spring. Uh, the contractor will begin that work then. And then we have the one that I just mentioned, Lori Marshall. Uh, to be determined if it's gonna be a studio or a one bedroom, it depends on the layout. Um, as far as the rental incentive pilot, we. We're able to obtain two properties 
um, for rent to local workers. One has a rent of $1,900. It's for a three bedroom, two year commitment. And the other is an $800 rent with yard and snow removal that the tenant is providing as well. And it's for a three bedroom, two year commitment. In addition, uh, Sherry at the Thompson Center has been successful in landing a home share tenant and match with a local resident. So that is moving forward as well. And the next slide. So what this has cost us is 66,000 of the funds of the $93,000 funds that we received. <laughs> so we've put 12,000 in into startup costs. So that's really Trina's time and attorney fees, really establishing the programs and working out all the details and all the legal details. So that's where about 18% of the money has gone. And then the program costs has been 54,000. That's 44,000 of incentives that we've awarded. Not all that money is spent, but it's committed. And then Trina's time is about 10,000 toward that. And so that gives us a per unit cost of 10,800. Mm -hmm. Compared to so many other programs, uh, seems reasonable. So we've got 27,000 remaining that's uncommitted that will carry on into our programs in 2023. And then going forwards, what we want to use is a multi-pronged approach to continue to increase these number of housing units. So we've got lots of different programs to, um, we'd like to work on, both in rentals, where we want to increase the appeal of, to property, creating reasonably priced year-round rental units for the local workforce. And that will be with existing and a couple of new programs. And then home ownership, we want to introduce programs and support to make it easier for the local workforce to purchase a home with these programs. Um, this Sorry, page, I, I'm just going ahead, Jill. If you, if you want to slow me down, let me know. And, and really ask questions anytime you want through this as well. So here's the list of current programs that we want to continue on the left side. We've, and we'll talk about each of those. And then on the right side, we've got six new, new programs and services that we want to talk about. With the existing programs, we want to continue them, but they were all pilots. And so we want to improve them based on what we've been learning. So then now we can go through them one by one and probably that's where you're going to have your questions. Okay, okay so Trina, do you want to take these? Sure. So we'd like to continue the AD Workforce Rental Incentive. Um, the program, just as a reminder, was $10,000 available for design, permitting, or construction. And in return, the ADU is uh, available to rent to a local worker in uh, working in Woodstock for three years. Um, currently, there's a minimum one-year lease and a maximum monthly rent amount so that the rent is affordable to the workforce here in Woodstock. Um, some of the enhancements we're talking about are <clears throat> working with the select board and the trustees, planning and zoning um, to reduce some of the costs incurred in creating the ADUs, uh, seeing if we can get a zoning permit exemption and also see if we can get a reduction, actually not a reduction, but I guess I would say a, a, a postponement or an abatement of the property taxes for the ADU to the end of the agreement period of three years. Is what we're why, why is zoning oh a, a fee exemption, not the exemption of the zoning permit? I got it. Okay. And the other question I had was ADU must be available to rent to a local worker for three years. In other words, that worker would have to commit to that that location for three years. Is that correct? Yes. No, just the landlord. No. The it's landlord has to commit renting locally for three years, they, but it could okay. be three different year-long tenants. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it could yes. The least All right. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, be, before you leave this, sorry. Go ahead. Before, before you leave this one, um, the, the, the are you are there any changes proposed? We don't have to go into all the details, but are there any ch changes proposed to the rental amounts, like the the rent limits and so forth? Or or if there were, you would come back to the EDC with that? Or mm. okay, so it's, it's a detail. This, this one seems to be working, so we haven't got yes. 
changes on this one. It's the next one we want to make changes to because it's not working as well as we think it ought to. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Keep going, yeah. Oh, I have to keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we also want to make some improvements to the rental incentive. And as a reminder, uh, the rental incentive grant is available to someone who wants to uh, put their place into the rental program for one year or two years um, <clears throat> to a local worker. Again, it's just kind of the same requirements and the lease must be for a one year minimum. Um, and in return, we would give them the $7,000 for a two year. And if it was a one year, I believe it was 3000. So what we wanna do is make some enhancements to this. Um, since we've only been able to achieve two rentals out of the five that we'd set a goal for, uh, we were considering extending the program to include owners of properties that are close to Woodstock, but they must rent it to someone who's employed in Woodstock. There were a couple of applicants that we'd received that were right on the border or close to Woodstock and we couldn't accept them into the program. So. We've, we've seen firsthand that there is interest beyond the Woodstock border. We'd also like to change the incentive amounts to incentivize more than a one occupant in a unit. Um, what we've seen is um, uh, one tenant in a larger three bedroom place, and we'd like to see more tenants in a larger place if it has more bedrooms, change the incentive amount based on possibly uh, the number of bedrooms have that uh, as part of our calculation, if you will, for the grant. Yeah, I ask something, please. Yeah, explain what that means exactly. Wait, 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 wait. Patrick first. Um, I apologize ahead of time. I'm, I've been on my feet since 4.30 this morning and uh, <laughs> my brain's a little foggy, but um, and I appreciate your patience. Um, where it says program, the second one now, three grants of up to $7,000 available for property owners to rent a unit that is currently a short-term rental or unused rent for long-term rental. Can you explain that a little bit? I'm, and I'm sorry to, you know, if I don't get grasp it right away, but uh, it's not really clear. Does that mean that a property owner will be given a $7,000 grant for at, at three different years for so, somebody who can rent that long term? Is that so, correct? Yeah, well, so they will receive the total of the grant is 7,000. So, for example, um, the two rental um, applicants that we uh, had this past year, they both signed up for two year leases. So, they've got to have a person rent it for one year. Um, or for two year term, depending on what they want to do as a landlord, that's up to them. But they signed up for a two year term to give a local worker a home. So in that case, they do get $7,000, but that's it. It's just $7,000 total. And then we break that down yeah. over two years. Um, and during that time, for example, I just, we received the lease on one of them. So we paid half of it. The other half will be paid in the second year after I do a compliance check to make sure that the tenant is still working in Woodstock. Right. Okay. So is that does that um, that seven thousand dollars would a tenant have to contribute to that seven thousand, or is just a a flat grant in addition to the rent that a landlord would receive? It's a grant in addition to the rent they receive. However, okay. let me mention right. that the rent is reduced so i it's not the typical market rent that you're seeing right now um for woodstock so we've capped those so that they're affordable for middle income workforce in woodstock okay so for example if an apartment was available for a family for fifteen hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. right how would all this apply the four the seven thousand would would the landlord get fifteen hundred dollars a month in addition to $7,000 for two years? So if someone has an apartment and they apply, and did you say it was a three bedroom? Yeah, so you said that for, as an example. Okay, so as an example, currently the program works, or you wanted to know how we what we wanted to do later? You know, how it works now. Okay, so currently if someone, someone applies, they want to be part of this rental incentive. They've never rented because we aren't, 
um, if you're an existing landlord and already renting, then you're not eligible for the program because you're already renting in Woodstock. Our goal is to try to attract additional landlords or parcel homeowners um, into the program so we can add more rentals into the area, not just circulate the ones that are already out there. Oh, I get it. So I want to convert yeah. short-term renters, you know, people who are doing their places short. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Convert the hope would be that the short-term rental folks would transition over. However, that hasn't uh, hasn't happened. Uh, but and we have ideas on what what we can do to work with short-term rental owners and or the town to maybe improve that a little bit. Right. So, so if a landlord has a history of having rented in the past two local workers, this would not apply. Only if correct? they rented within the last 12 months. <clears throat> Say they rented a couple of years ago and then they got out of it for whatever yeah. reason and then they want to get back into it, they could do it okay. now. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Right, you're welcome. Any other questions, let me know. Yeah. So uh, I don't think I finished this. So we want to extend the uh, program to properties outside, um, uh, close to Woodstock. And we also want to look at possibly changing the incentive amounts to incentivize more uh, for one occupant in the unit. And we want to review existing lease periods, rent limits, grant amounts, and adjust if we need to. And by that, I mean, um, as, as you know, I think a, even a few of you in this meeting um, asked about uh, seasonal or more, uh, a shorter term lease than one year. So that's something we're going to look into because we want to address your your interests in, in that. But we'd like to know what we work. Maybe a, a, a slight yeah. comment on that specific issue. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, my family and I own a cafe here in town. And this past summer, we recruited workers from Colombia, Jamaica, Pakistan, and these were short term, you know, just summer help. None of this would apply for that, would it? Or would it? That's what well not that's part that's currently. not currently. Not currently. But but, but that is something we want to look into for next year. For sorry. next year. Sorry. Hold, oh, sorry or for me... this year. Yeah, I forget what year. I, I, I don't believe Trina, I don't believe that you have enough information to say whether it would apply or not. Joe, if and let me just say yeah. why. Joe, if the cafe was willing to was willing to rent or if, if 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 you were willing to sign a one year lease even not knowing who you were going to put it in right that that's really a, the, the question in other words if you were willing to sign a one year lease as a tenant um would the, would a would a person who rented to 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 the cafe rather than to the person and the cafe said we're going to put our employees into it right now we have someone for the summer but after that, we're going to, you know, we always have turnover and we're going to put, we're going to, we, we need places to put our workers. Would that person qualify for that incentive? I got it. Okay. No, Thank no, no. Asked, that's a question. I'm not a question. Yes, they would as, it, as it's written. But we now, we have property owners who are interested in doing a shorter lease than six months, than 12 months. So we want to explore that side because we believe there are workers who are, who could match that. As another way. So basically you're looking at yes. different ways of matching worker need with housing supply. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. Right. So in a situation like, say, for example, Joe, uh, then, you know, it'd be interesting to know, you know, what term of lease are you looking at when you bring in those type of seasonal workers? Is it right. three months, four months, six months? Things like that. Typically, typically it's, it's a seasonal thing. It's seasonal. You know, it starts it's, around um, the end of May and it goes till the end of October or the end of, middle of September, October, depending on the individual, what their commitments are. So how many months would you say? Like at least, I'm just curious. Three or well, it'll go from, from like the middle of May and the, either the middle of September or the middle of October. Yeah, so that's about months. a six-month lease. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah. just curious. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So we, you know, it, to that end, kind of like we're talking about, we want to be able to work with uh, short-term rentals or owners to try to see if we can kind of bridge that gap for the workforce. Yeah. I just mentioned previously that I've been up since 4.30. <laughs> and um, 
a lot of that day today was talking to different landlords about different populations, different <laughs> prospects. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. Thank you. Oh, yeah, me too. Any other questions on this slide? And we'll go to the next, if not. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Now, last, uh, as far as uh, continuing and improving existing programs, ADU support service. Um, the program here was basically to help simplify building ADUs, answering questions to help those that are wanting to build that. And we, most of the folks that have done the ADU so far are, have been self-sufficient and they're kind of doing it on their own. But we get, I get a lot of questions regarding uh, planning and zoning and some other things. So we wanna explore that further and really build this out so that we can simplify building the ADU. Um, whether it's your permitting questions um, with planning and zoning, uh, where to go if you need help with state funds like the VHIP program and other things like that, uh, tools, checklists, uh, things to help guide the land lords or property owners to simplify building the ADU. Uh, we also want to build some more resources, local contractors and other professionals that would be on board with partnering with us and being part of this program. Any questions on that one? And that, Trina, that would be you as an extended role? Yes. Okay. I've kind of Thank been you. doing it a little bit, but it's been informal, just you know. But we want to formalize it a little bit more, work more with planning and zoning, um, and cr actually create a handbook that would kind of take you through the steps. Um, so, yes, expanding my role and creating this in the next few months. Any other questions? Not for me. No, we're good. Okay. Jill, do you want to start with the new stuff or do you want me to continue? Sure, on? go right ahead. I'll do one. Okay. So <laughs> these are the things that we think we can um, do to enhance the programs we have and introduce new programs, but these two are not very different. So the first one is. Well, home share incentive is such a simple idea where you take somebody who's already got a home and wouldn't mind having somebody share that home with them in exchange for rent and, and maybe doing some uh, chores around the house. So existing buildings, it could happen very quickly. In the year that they've had, or nearly a year that they've been running the program, they've only had one participant. So we'd like to add a financial incentive to, uh, that if people lease to a local worker, then we provide a thousand um, dollars a bedroom. Same kind of idea as we already do, but extending the uh, the, the rules a little bit. The so, second one. Sorry, before sorry. you go to the second one, do we have any? In, uh, this, I, I totally support this idea. If we have any indication that that financial incentive is is. Um, is something financial is something that would increase the volume or we have a high or is it just a hypothesis which would be okay with me too i'm just wondering where we are just a hypothesis um and it's a way that we can get involved and support them is there any do we have a sense that the lack of of effort and in marketing and you know in the of implementing the program is is also needed to increase the volume this seems like such an obvious idea I think just putting attention on it in any way will help it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We actually have a, I have a meeting with Sherry next week. So we'll be discussing some of this. Is there any programs that exist in other communities? Yes. This, so this is being tried out in Burlington right now. So Burlington Home Share Program has a um, hundred people a year involved in it, showing it is successful. And they've just added an incentive to make it even more successful. So you, you said they had a hundred now currently? A hundred a year. hundred a year. This is a national yeah. program, Patrick. Okay. I, and, may I add something here and ask Jill? Um, in our environment, in our community, it's Thompson, which is, a, you know, more of an elderly group and where we're working with. But I believe what we're talking about is putting some effort into 
you know, expanding that so that it's not just an idea for people who are elderly and need help in a house, that it's just an idea for any age group, you know, and that's where it's been successful in other communities. So yes. I believe that's the shift is saying, yes, Thompson does it, but we're trying to make it about any age group. Yes. Isn't, isn't that correct? Yeah. yeah, that's what's happening in um, the north of Vermont. Yes, yeah. thank you. Right, Deborah. very successfully. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so then the second idea is to take the ADU idea, but so an, a, an accessory dwelling unit right now is one building on an existing property. We've also had inquiries from people that want to create two units. So that takes you into another another category. So we'd be talking about multi-using, multi-unit housing rental incentives. So here we're going to deliberately encourage property owners to create multi-unit houses, duplexes, tri tri triplexes, and again incentivize them at ten thousand a unit. So we're talking about people building and get, uh, getting them involved in ten thousand a unit. And hopefully with the amount of money that is in the state budget at the moment, this may link into a state program. So, so just to be clear, this is basically exactly the same as the ADU program, except the number of you, it's, the ADU is by definition, because it's A yes. DU, then it's one. This is anything other than A DU. Right, right. Correct. <laughs> other, otherwise the same program. Yes. So does this is mean it's somebody who's building something from scratch or is it taking an existing building and turning it in to multi or it, both? It can be either. Either. Um, we highly support people taking an existing building and dividing it up because it's a lot uh, easier and potentially faster. But they would have to adhere to the same rules as the ADU where they rent to a local worker for a few years. Are there any issues with town planning or? or uh... So the we, these are programs that we haven't explored completely yet, and we're not ready to start them tomorrow. And that, that would be one of the main questions. AD, accessory dwelling units have special permitting processes, and that's why we want to keep it separate. Yeah. And well, then, so uh, multi-unit homes as well have separate permitting and zoning requirements. And Steve's aware of some of those, and those are some of the uh, challenges that he's working on to those, eliminate. Those are much harder. I mean, the ADU is, is, is not just special, it's accelerated. Right. So the work that Trina's talking about, um, there are, we have many bylaws and ordinances which restrict the building that can go on in our community. And people, right now everywhere in the country are reviewing their bylaws and taking out some of the restrictions that are not helpful and are no longer really valid in the way that we live. And uh, Stephen Bauer is the planning and zoning director. He's been working on that planning commission and we should be seeing those changes happen in this year. So that's another one of the, the pieces of work that the group does with Trina that is, doesn't fit into any program that's valuable. Any more Any questions on this page, or should we go on? I think you can move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trina, do you want to do this one? Sure. <clears throat> Another um, area of, uh, that we would like to explore and introduce in 2023 is uh, landlord employer assistance pilot. So it'd be pilot because this, this would be new. Um, I get a lot of questions from landlords um, and regarding how to find a tenant and the tools that they need to find the tenant and things like that. So basically we would just formalize that into a separate or a new program uh, where we would provide more tools to the landlords and, and kind of increase their comfort, um, provide any training um, in, in, in renting because I know there's a lot of gossip out there regarding landlords and tenants and renting, and we want to dismiss that and educate um, everyone involved in the program so it's successful. Um, <clears throat> and we also have talked about doing um, tenant screening and credit checks, whether we do that or provide the funds to do that for the landlord 
so that that would ease the process for them, especially if they're a new landlord. The other piece of this is providing vouchers to be used towards employee housing rental. Um, and we need to do a little bit more on that, Jill. I don't know if you have more details on that we want to share now or we're just trying to uh in order to make this go further we need to do some work with employ with employers and to see if this would be valid but there's um other examples of using housing vouchers around the country and it might be a way for us to reduce the rent of um to, to make it affordable to local workers Any questions? It's a subsidy that the rent would be a subsidy to the tenant or the landlord? To the employee. To the employee. Is what we're thinking right now, but we have to explore it much more. But so when if you think about the rents in our community, many of them have gone over 2,500. Mm -hmm. So that unit is outside of a local worker's affordability. But if we gave the employee a voucher to use, then that starts to become more affordable. There's a different way of making a for, bring another unit into the workforce. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, we, obviously we need to explore it. So, you know, never opposed to exploring things, but I would just be careful because it's essentially an unlimited, I mean, it's really the employer's obligation to pay their employees. It's an unlimited, it's an unlimited incentive. Uh, every, every employee would be eligible for it and well, and we would we yes we would not allow that because I, we couldn't ever afford it so this one would take a lot more investigation to yeah. see if it's still going to be valid by the time you have to put the restraints on to make it a, a affordable as a grant and whether it's a, yeah and, and whether it's appropriate you know i mean it, it, it's the same yeah and, and whether it's actually solving and you yeah, might want I'd say it's got a lot, a lot of, a lot of problems with that one. I yeah, did, yeah lots. <laughs> but, so you might have to restrict it to teachers, for example. Yeah. But uh, something to explore. Yeah, uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, the second, uh, the first bullet point. Sorry, but, uh, uh, Trina mentioned looking at whether or not we would be doing the credit checks and screening, or simply training people and so forth. Again. I'm not opposed to exploring any of the different options. I, I do think that helping people to do that, that 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 the a difficulty in doing that task, it's a reasonable hypothesis to say that that's limiting in some way the availability of spaces. But I think the EDC should be extraordinarily cautious about. Uh, well, I I, John, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more because then you then then you. Uh, fall in the category of responsibility. If there's yeah. a mistake made or a misjudgment made, then the responsibility would fall on the EDC, not the landlord. And I think the landlord should be responsible. But I do think in that I opinion. do think that giving them the tool that, that they that the tools are not trivial and finding good ones and the, the maybe yeah, even helping right. to subsidize the tools, giving training for the tools, things of that sort, having a corporate yeah. license that we could give out to a hundred people rather than yeah. each of them having have to pay for it, you know, those kinds of things that avoid right. the responsibility sound like a very right. good exactly great feedback thank you keep going yes please <clears throat> um cliff do you want to do this one Sure. Okay. So um, another program that we've thought about doing or services, if you will, would be the home buyer gateway services. Um, but we're just, again, providing a single access point uh, resources to help support home buyers uh, with education, um, where the where and how to do the forms. And I, I guess in light of some of the landlord services that we were just talking about, um, Two, this would be a little different, but you could it's just providing the services, not actually uh, filling out the forms, I believe. So can I talk a bit more about this one? Yes. So there are many, many state programs uh, to help home buyers get started. They're quite complicated. There's multiple sources that you have to go to. So the idea was that 
uh, Trina could become the one person who knows her way around the system and just get people off the starting block. So not saying that here's what you have to do and he, these people will definitely give you your money, but saying, okay, so you need to go to VHFA and it sounds like you're eligible for that. And this is the mm -hmm. one you really want to ask about and just get people started. Or you need to go talk to Twin Pines Housing. They have this grant that, that would work with some of your income. Um, and those are the kind of calls I'm fielding right now, uh, just because people don't know where to go. And it takes, a, it takes a while and you might get people get started on the pathway here. Wow. Any questions? Any further comments? Jill, that, that was for your, your down payment assistant, right? No, that's for the home buyer gateway. Service. Home buyer gateway, okay. That, I just want to make sure. And then Cliff, do you want to do number five? Yeah, I can jump into it briefly. So there's uh, basically, as Jill just mentioned, there's a lot of housing programs already some of which offer uh, down payment assistance, VHFA being one of them. It's it's very restrictive. A lot of it's restricted to first-time home buyers, as an example. So to give you a use case of what this pilot would be going for, it's, uh, let's say you have two people that work at the schools, um, earn less than 125 k probably significantly less, um, but are moving here from another market. So they have to sell their home to buy a home here. They can't afford anything in here they decide not to take those jobs and stay where they are. Uh, so these are actually things that are happening in Woodstock right now. Um, and so this program would be designed to, uh, they would have to go through the VHFA, prove that they applied and, and didn't qualify or qualified for a lesser amount, whatever it is, and then be eligible to receive up to 5% of their down payment. Um, I. Linked, it's not in here, but we have further details. There's a lot of programs like this that uh, they're typically structured as a zero interest loan that's forgiven after the person stays in the home for two years. So we would just model it after a successful existing program. Yeah, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, I think I think this is a great idea. My my one thought on how do you navigate, you know, the it's already hard to have a long escrow, especially in a market like Woodstock, a resort town. So how would how would it work in terms of timing? Would is it fast enough where a buyer would still, you know, be in the game with the seller while they're going through this process? Yeah, it's designed to work with any fin financing contingency. So essentially, we just want to attach it as um, yeah, behind you know second position to their first mortgage. And then it, so working, the more we could work with uh, existing banks in Vermont to make it a program like, uh, and it's not in here, but the Federal Credit Union has a, does a lot of work with the VHFA, Vermont Federal Credit Union. And so I think part of it would be working with people that are coming to the area looking for support and housing through the home buyer gateway services, making sure we match them with lenders who understand the program. Cool, cool. <laughs> Any more questions on this page? Should we go to the next one? So the last one we want to talk to you about is um, that we think it's time to start a housing forum where we can, as the EDC, can facilitate a regular meeting of housing development enthusiasts. So there are lots of people talking about doing different things. And they might be a developer, a builder, an investor, nonprofits, planning and zoning is involved, the grant advisor could be involved. And right now, a lot of people are working separately or in pairs, and it feels like it's time to bring everyone together and start talking about how we can really crack the big nuts and start doing nine units here and 10 units here and go for, see how we can make the bigger projects that are really quite scary, work with more people being involved who know what they're doing. Great, any questions from anybody? I, I have a question. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, Jill, I, I, this is a great idea. You, you and I've talked about this and I'm just wondering, I, I, I'm, this is jumping ahead. So I'm just curious as to your thinking. If we decided to implement the what I'll call the multi ADU program, the ten thousand dollars per unit for two for someone building a duplex or a triplex, 
different zoning, therefore it has to be a different program. Mm -hmm. What if someone came and said, I want to build 30 units? Right. So would we give uh, them 10,000 a unit? I would be in favor of that. But can we go but, to the next page? So have, take a look at the numbers that we've done for this year, and then let's come back to your question. So we, we've totaled all these programs up, assuming they, would, they could all go forwards, and we've come up with 250,000 as, in, as uh, something that we could write a grant application for. So we've expanded the hours of the housing advisor and the compensation level, to be perfectly honest, what Trina is doing is not an admin level job, it's a program manager. So we've put a bit more in there for her. We've put in 6,000 for attorney fees. Um, and then we've, uh, the, the program costs are just the incentive costs. So ADUs are 70,000 because we want seven grants at 10,000 a unit. The rental incentives are three at 7,000 which is really just going to cost us 3000 because we've already got some money from 2022. The ADU support is housing advisor time. And then the new programs, 10,000, 40,000, 6,000, housing advisor time, 80,000, and housing advisor time for the forum. So if somebody came to us with a nine unit proposal and we wanted to support that at 90,000, we'd have to come to you and say what this this is what's going to ha this could happen and we could do this so what we were thinking is we can learn on uh, the multi unit housing program with 40,000 and be ready for the bigger opportunities i have a question it's, it's I'm, i don't i don't know if it's if you can connect it this or not but there's a lot of Discussion statewide, federal wise about affordable housing and housing for people who need it. Does, has that ever been opposed to looked at, or is there anything that on the state or federal level that can you can tap into for any of this? So, a, a no, good, I see what I'm getting at, Joe. Yes, a good example of that is the down payment assistant pilot. So we would not compete with any state programs. And in fact, we would insist that somebody tries for one of the state programs first, and then we will fill in the gap. And what we're doing in all of these programs is filling in the gaps. So the ADU workforce rental incentive, the state is providing, as Trina talked about, the state is providing a lot of money to build ADUs and ours is complementary. And, and in this case can be additional to make it really happen. And the way it's worked is that people have come to us first and then we funnel them into the state program so that people can get the maximum value out of those programs. Um, so, so we watch them all the time and we're mm -hmm. very careful not to be um, duplicative. Yeah, that's and, and in fact, Jill, two of your programs, two, two of the ADU people, at least two of them that I know of, are doing the state as well as your grant all three of them are oh all three of them okay great even better mm -hmm. thank you okay. Todd? Well, i think you guys are doing a great job yeah you really are okay. um I, it, it's obviously a lot of a lot of work um a lot of time and you should be complimented at least i do thank you thank you so todd has a question and then john yeah, just um, just like a point, as I'm a landlord in multiple states now, that the biggest problem I see in Vermont is the, in terms of rent, so like if you were like, oh, I don't qualify for this program, but I wish I did. We talked about this when you guys started it with the rules, but the cost of energy in the winter for heating the building, like for my two apartments, it's $3,000. So is there something, Trina, that you can like, put in there in your, you know, education pack or whatever. Because if a landlord gets, it's about dollars and cents and profit and loss, right? So to help a landlord do the right thing, if there's other ways they can see to save as well, that might help them tag on your incentives. So if I if I got the knowledge that I can get 7,000 for two years, but also Green Mountain Power has this 35% rebate and I didn't know about it and you sort of helped me with that, 
then that might be enough to move the needle, right? So I'm just sort yes. of thinking about what costs yes. the most money for me in my building. And it's honestly, it's it's to heat it. That's a really good idea. And that, and it we is. Could that, and then hopefully the 7,000 that we give you could be directed toward energy improvements and insulation. And we could get you involved with Sustainable Woodstock mm -hmm. who do an insulation program and they know all about all the different programs. So... I mean, the more people that you bring into this family, the more that you can connect them to all the different things that are happening. And Todd, uh, uh, I'll check onto the healthy homes and send you the information on that as well, because you. I actually, I have it. I'm just thinking about the, app. I, I've got, okay. I'm all yeah. deep. I'm deep in, but you know what? I'll take it though. Maybe there's something. Uh, help, uh, I will uh, healthy homes. Yeah, any, anywhere we can find a dollar, we're going to find it. So we're yeah. going to. Did you guys ever know that a 200 year old building has really bad insulation? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Uh -huh. uh, John, do you want to do your question? Oh, uh, yeah. This is really a comment for next time if we, you know, as you think about refining this and, and taking feedback and so forth. The, I, I, the cost per unit of, um, of 10,800, which is after you take the fixed costs. Um, that seems to me to be a reasonable metric and one that we have shown that we can achieve. It's really $11,000 per unit. Um, a, you know, a third of this cost is is, suggest, is creating capacity at $20,000 a unit. Um, and I don't see the additional economic impact of that. I think there's a societal impact, but not an economic impact. And so I would, I would just, be, I would think about how to justify, I, I would think about the mix, I, I would think about the cost per unit. Um, just, and why, why if there, if we think that there's more demand for 10,000 for, for well, units sure. that we can incent to 10,000, why we should be starting to incent them at 20,000 until we run out of demand at 10,000. Are you thinking about the down payment program? Yeah, I, I think that the down, the down payment program I don't see a reason. In other words, if 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 instead of eighty thousand for down payment to get four units, we said let's put eighty thousand into multi-unit housing and get eight units, I can't see why we wouldn't want to do that. Unless we thought there wasn't, unless we got to the end of demand, there is no more demand for ten thousand. Because John, you're dividing units. that twenty thousand over more years. The benefit extends over multiple years. The benefit yeah, extends over mul multiple years for the other one. Also, you're but getting the unit bill. Mm. If it's only getting four units, well, well, one, one at a time, one at a time. Go ahead, Marin. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, the, the, the difference is, I think, John, is because it's only four units versus 10 units. No. He's well, talking about the down payment for the home. Uh, right, but he wants to take that. John, if I understand you correctly, you're saying take that 80,000 and put it into ADUs. Can I answer the question? Uh, yes, please, please do. Please do. <laughs> the ADU grant is a $10,000 grant. And in exchange for that, you get a rental unit for three years. Well, the 20,000 payment is a home as long as the home is owned. Yeah, that's, that's both what you said is correct, but not complete. Okay. What we get for 10,000 is a new housing unit created forever mm -hmm. for as long as it's created and a guarantee that it will be rented to the workforce for three years. What we get for $20,000 is actually not a, anything new created <laughs> but we are guaranteed that it will be used and so forth and so i just think that that um, i i just think we need to be considering we're actually not creating any new units with the down payment mm -hmm. assistance we're not increasing supply we're increasing availability to a segment i'm not opposed to it i'm just saying that i i, I think that we we are finally tonight as soon as patrick makes his presentation it will, we have finally reached what for me was the objective of the next phase of EDC, which is having more things to spend money on good things than we have money to spend. Mm -hmm. And so that now is going to require us because we can't afford to do this and Patrick's proposal and the childcare thing. We don't have enough money. This is fantastic. This is not bad. All of these ideas are great and they all do economic value. But once we get into a, re, in, into a, a place where funding is, is our constraint, which it is now, we then have to start to think about optimizing what the best way to do that. And I think in that context, we should just be thinking about the pros and cons of the down payment program. I do, they're different. I do agree that you that there's a guarantee for a longer impact. So it, it just take that into account as we 
as we come, you know, as we consider it. Okay, okay. Larry, you got something to say, Larry? Um, yeah, it's not quite as erudite as what John was talking about. I, I'm on the same subject, the down payment assistance. Um, and just when you, you presumably are coming back to us, um, I'd like to see uh, the, some detailed criteria as to who would be uh, eligible for this. I think it's a little tricky, uh, trickier subject than the other uh, programs you have. It's, actually, it's all great stuff, uh, but um, I, I think you have to, I would like to see some specific criteria um, with that. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, I just want to point out something, um, John. Yes, I am in agreement with you. I, it's fantastic that we're getting all of these big ideas and um, big opportunities. But I also want to point out that I'm not so sure it's exactly correct that we don't have enough money for both in the sense that this program isn't going to all be spent in one year. It's similar to what happened with um, the marketing that was approved before where it was in, in several years of, of the 1% coming to the EDC. So, you know, in fact, we might, you know, look at the dollars and, and say, no, we can commit X dollars this year and X dollars next year to make sure that we can fund this entire project. We could, we'd still have to, I, I still think it's worth justifying why we would choose to create a fewer number of units with different characteristics rather than more units with different characteristics. I I understand. I'm just it's saying dollar, dollar wise, yeah. you know, it could be a two year commitment as opposed to coming out of one space. Yeah, and I wonder if, it, if I, my own thought, Deborah, is I'm wondering if it's wise to commit money that we really haven't got yet. Um, In other words, commit next year's revenues without them really being here yet. I mean, things can happen. Yes, and we've already done it before. We did it with marketing. Yep. And yep. similar to the child care issue, um, the money that we've committed, it doesn't actually go out until things actually happen, right? That you need to have the teacher come in, you need to up the amount of people before they, you know, students yep. in before they get their next piece of funding. You know, yeah, there, there's point. some fluidity to how the funding goes out. And I think that that's just, um, uh, a, it's something to consider as we consider. Okay. Deborah, I'd like to just correct one thing you said. The, the marketing budget wasn't future money. It was past money that hadn't been used. Huh. Okay. Just, 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 we use past money plus this year's money. We didn't spend money that didn't exist. Okay. No, so let's, well, let's, let's, I'm not let's asking you to spend money that didn't exist. That's not what I'm no, saying. No, that, no, that no. I understand it. I understand what you're yeah. saying. I understand what you're saying. It's budgeting. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. So let's continue on with, with the housing, Jill. Um, so with housing, well, uh, Todd, do you have a question related to this? Yeah, just, yeah, just really quickly. I think, I think. Just to button this up, philosophically, you know, we should be hearing everything, no matter how much it might cost, that could be a benefit to the town. So we should support all these until we need to get into the nitty gritty um, and hear everything. And I think to John's point, I agree that new housing is better than recycling old housing. So I'd also like to see more in that as we move forward. But I'm, I'm, I'm up for all these ideas. Thank you. OK, thank you. So thanks for all your feedback. And we'll get ready to go to the next stage now, which is writing the application so that we can um, secure more funds for the programs we want to carry on with, secure Trina's services for the year and um, secure some funds so we can keep keep detailing all these other programs. Great. Thank you. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you for your time. Okay. Great job, guys. Yeah. Yeah, Great thank job. You. Thank you. Next agenda, child care. I, I, my understanding is we're going to uh, forego any discussion on that tonight because of the uh, upcoming select board meeting on the 17th. And then, yeah, there's no, no new news. Uh, no new news. No new news okay. on child care. Okay. Holding back. And let's go to marketing. Patrick, take it away. Okay. Uh, John, thank you. Okay. What we're going to do uh, is we're going to take you through sort of what we achieved this year the results that we got, 
uh, and the impact that we've made from an economic development standpoint. Uh, and Charles from class four is gonna take us through that. And then at the end, I'm gonna take us through uh, sort of what we'd like to propose for uh, the next budget that we'd like to basically go over this now, have you guys ask questions and then uh, vote on approving a budget uh, for marketing uh, in February. So this way we have time, you guys can ask me questions, we can ask questions here and we can give you more detail. So John, if you can uh, take us to the next page and I'm gonna let Charles take over. I'll give you one of these mics. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Look, I'll just pop at the top of the table and I'll yeah. over here. All right, so those of you that don't know me, I'm Charles. I work with class four and Patrick along with the rest of the marketing committee. We started working with the team here uh, in August of 2021 um, and we launched our program in 22. Uh, before we get going, again, like Patrick mentioned, we're gonna cover a few you know, basic performance notes of the program along with the allocation request from this uh, coming year. To start with though, uh, I just wanna kind of phrase this so we all understand exactly what we're talking about. Um, you know, I would encourage the EDC to look at marketing really as more of a baseline cost of doing business rather than an initiative. We've captured a fairly sizable amount of data to suggest that it's really a necessity if we plan to nurture and engage the next generation of visitors, residents, business owners in the town. And as we get into this presentation, we'll show you some data to corroborate that, uh, a little bit more background. Before we even got started with this presentation, um, you know, this has actually gone through several rounds. I've worked with Patrick and the rest of the team. Um, the initial allocation request was around $200,000. Um, that isn't money that, that sits in my firm's uh, pocket. That's just spread out across all the stakeholders that manage this program. And we've actually brought that number uh, significantly lower. In fact, we are looking at a 20% decrease in overall marketing spend from the pilot program of 2022. So, it's a fairly sizable decrease um, and we've done our best to sharpen the pencil, eliminate the components of the program, which had a little bit of bloat, which weren't performing as well as we had hoped and put additional dollars behind parts of the program that actually are driving an economic impact. And truthfully that, that serve many of the other goals from other groups on the EDC. So we'll get into that along the way. And that's 20% of the complete marketing budget, not just what we did for the uh, that we approved last year, but it also includes social media coordinator, how, uh, host, uh, you know, pardon me, maintenance on the website and things like that. So it, we're, we're looking at this budget not as four or five different grants, which has been done in the past. We're looking at this as one grant. So we're gonna be cutting this cost by 20% across all of those grants. Yeah, that, that's right, Patrick. So and we'll talk a little bit more about the consolidation as we dig a little deeper. You know, to start out with, this this part of the presentation is really just a background um, and providing you with some context for where these numbers came from. To start with, you know, my team asked the question here uh, that you can see, and that's how can Woodstock remain relevant in a travel and tourism industry, which is pivoting entirely to the digital space? There's a certain part of our audience, really between 20 and 30 percent, which already actually has entirely pivoted into that space. And so as that core audience ages beyond marketing, the people who live here, the people who are coming here, how does Woodstock activate the next generation of tourists, new community members, you know, people who will open businesses in town and, and those who live, work and discover entirely online? Um, our aspirational goals, this is really what drives um, the program. Next slide, John. And so this is really a two-part goal, right? The first is to position Woodstock as the quintessential New England lifestyle destination in the digital space. And the second piece of this is really future-proofing the town as fully self-sustainable from a digital standpoint. That's finding, nurturing, and activating a qualified audience that is 100% owned by the town. That means that our opportunity to communicate with this audience doesn't exist from the moment they enter the town to the moment they leave. It exists 24 seven, wherever they live. Um, and that's really the fundamental sort of foundation of this program. The second piece is providing free native marketing support for Woodstock's economic engine. That's locally. So that's our businesses, our community initiatives, our events. We've built a qualified lead list um, that numbers in, you know, it's not a three, 4,000 person lead list. It's a 20 plus thousand person lead list that is entirely qualified 
And that's a resource that we hope to leverage to support events in town, um, initiatives that are both town sponsored and privately sponsored that sort of fit into the realm of economic development. Um, you know, that could be something like, you know, a festival here or even, you know, book stock on the green. And then finally, communicate directly with our visitors and new audiences. And that eliminates the need to rely exclusively on endemic and organic paid press. We know that the majority of traffic of digital engagements to Woodstock in the past have been a result of either paid programs, actually primarily no cost programs, um, where Woodstock, the town has been featured, uh, the experiences around Woodstock have been featured and that results in uh, growth and influx of tourists here in the village. And, and if remember we did the, the they did the uh, PR program, which was very difficult to measure whether there was really any result from that. That's right. So John, you can jump to the next slide. So in 2022, when we started the program, these were our focus areas, um, really just two focus areas. The first on the content side of things, developing a content pool of assets to support the program. Um, part of the 2023 allocation request, this initiative is we'll be actually delivering those assets to businesses, making them available to the general public. But those were captured successfully over 12 production days here in town. And really the second piece of this is the digital marketing program, which was reviewed in August. Um, there's a lot more detail. We're gonna cover very high level metrics today, but it's really a five step scalable process. And I wanna take a moment to describe that process so that we're all talking about this really from the same perspective. We all understand what's happening here. So this process, again, it's a closed loop and it's scalable so that as uh, we see growth in any one of the segments we'll cover in a moment, it can, we can adapt. And we can change our message to communicate with different groups, whether that's an audience that we're hoping to attract to live here, business owners who we're hoping to attract and grow businesses here, uh, individuals who we think will come to an event, we already know they're interested, or just a general tourism focus. We have the ability through this framework to talk to all of them. And so the first step is to understand the visitor journey. We spent about half of last year doing a fairly sizable amount of market research and building out segments, four core segments actually, um, that really define who comes to Woodstock, why they're coming to Woodstock, and, and what they do here while, while they're in Woodstock. The second piece is to attract those new prospects. That's the digital advertising. That's taking our content that we created, taking our story, and putting it in front of audiences which we think, based on research, will, will either you know, engage with the town digitally or eventually convert and, and visit the village. And the third piece is capturing those prospects. So at this point, you know, what we're doing is we're taking, you've probably heard the term third-party data. That's just general web data. That's who you are on the internet. We're taking that third-party data and we're converting it into first-party data. And that's be important here because once it's converted to first-party data, we have the ability to communicate directly with those prospects. They're no longer floating around in the world, you know, and, and they have this limited opportunity to engage with us, you know, through a news source or, you know, in town while they're here we can talk to them whenever we want. So it puts us in control of that audience versus putting them in control of when to come to Woodstock. And then beyond that, we nurture them. And that's the unpaid advertising. That's the message, that's the stories, that's the communication that takes place on a monthly basis. It falls into two categories. There's a fairly complex automation program, which sort of uh, gives this initial impression of for every single prospect that's seasonal and based on their segment. And then there's an organic component of this where we're sending you know, think of this as your typical town newsletter. Um, it goes out on a monthly basis, it details events. In the future, as part of 2023, what we hope to do is really establish that resource as an opportunity for any event business in the town meeting certain criteria to activate themselves. Um, so you think, know, th think of that as, as somebody's running an event and we can put them in, in the newsletter the month before it happens to help promote people to know, hey, this is this thing's going like TEDx or the uh, Bookstock. Thank you. That was, that was the one. I was oh, yeah, but those are both great examples. You know, you know, TEDx or Bookstock, for example, a ticketed event. What we're doing is we're placing that event immediately uh, on day one in front of a large volume, a large audience, which is qualified already and already has, you know, outperformed in terms of engagement. But beyond that, this applies to businesses as well. So imagine you're, you know. Um, Vermont Eclectic, you know, the t-shirt business here in town, okay, and you own a business that's, that's really, you know, sort of a retail brick and mortar environment, but you also have a limited e-commerce component. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Either way, what we can do is uh, do a profile on that business, Vermont Eclectic, promote that through the blog, promote that at no cost through our organic email, 
And suddenly we're putting that product, that business immediately in front of 20,000 plus qualified prospects as well, who will buy through the e-commerce funnel. So we're taking our audience and we're actually feeding it into all of the businesses as well, because once they buy from Vermont Eclectic, they're now in Vermont Eclectic's business and they can keep buying from Vermont Eclectic. And so through this, we can begin to nurture the businesses that already exist in the town and give them more control and more power in the digital space as well. So it has this sort of auxiliary benefit and that's really what the activation, the final component of this program is. You know, before I jump onto the next slide, it's important to note that this does exist in a closed loop because the more activation we're able to complete within the owned audience, the better our targeting and algorithm gets at the top of the funnel. And without going into too much detail, we're basically making an educated guess at the top of funnel based on market research. And we don't actually know if these audiences will convert. Some of them do, some of them don't. But the ones that do give us data on, on what works and those signals, whether that's their income, whether that's their zip code, whether that's their interest, their core buying behaviors, allow us to find more audiences that match those buying behaviors. So naturally over time, the program is self-optimizing to be, become more and more effective. Um, and you can go to the, the next slide, John. Before we go ahead, can I just ask a quick question? Did we, the plan was when we extended the budget through the end of February, the plan was to make sure that we got a full four seasons for the digital content pool. Did we, did we achieve that? Well, three seasons because we we didn't we, we haven't been through a, a, a stick season mud season type type of scenario yet. So that's planned for the next one that we'll know. What we did do is we've got the three major seasons: summer, uh, foliage, and winter. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So that's right. So. When I sort of mentioned that, right, that, that five-step process previously, understand, attract, capture, nurture, and activate, this is kind of how it plots out in a funnel. So at the top of the funnel, right, we're attracting. That's why the visitors come to Woodstock, understanding that and what those signals mean from where, why are they here. We're taking that creative, that relevant creative, and we've actually partnered with a couple select local businesses in the hospitality space to offer incentives. We're taking that and, and we're really pushing that at these audiences, hoping they come to the website. That's kind of our, our first touch point. And then that segmented creative drives that audience into interest-driven and value-driven prospects. So we, we cut them out in between. And we have creative that it, we're pushing at interest-driven prospects and value-driven prospects. For example, if you fall into that sort of secondary category, you may see an incentive that says, listen, engage with Woodstock, take these steps, and you might win a free night stay at the Woodstock Inn or the blue horse in. If you fall into sort of the interest-driven demo, we're actually starting with those segments right away. We say, listen, we know you like um, outdoor biking, uh, you know, outdoor activities. So we're gonna lead with creative, we're gonna lead with messaging, which shows that type of content. And then in the middle here, this orange piece, we're capturing them, where they land on the website. And then at the bottom, we're communicating directly with the lead. So there's an automation component that provides this unique introduction over the course of several weeks. Uh, and that's based on qualification data you provided. Look, if you said, I like, I like outdoor activities, I like biking, um, it's the summer, and you sign up, you're going to receive an introduction to Woodstock that is built for people who like outdoor activities in the summertime. You're going to see biking, you might see some fly fishing, you might see all sorts of outdoor activities. The food and shopping segment doesn't see those activities. They can still access them, but what we're really pushing there is um, the opportunities for food and shopping in Woodstock, which admittedly in the past season were, were a challenge. Um, and then beyond that, there's an organic messaging, and, and that's the visibility that comes to TEDx, to Bookstock, to Flurry, events that we promote organically through this program. And that's we can do that at, at no cost uh, in 2023 to those businesses. The next slide you'll see really just explains that funnel you know in terms of pictures you are probably familiar with the uh, images on the left that's uh, an example of a top of funnel advertising this happens to be in facebook um, we have ads outside of facebook as well uh, in the instagram as well um, on social stories etc that center image is the lead magnet if you navigate right now uh, on your computer to woodstock's town website not the the, uh, the village website, you'll see something similar, um, an incentive that, and there, there's a test here where we A-B test different incentives to see what works better for different audiences. And then on the right-hand side, you see, you know, just an image of, of just one part of a multi-part flow. This is for the incentive-driven audience. They receive this email message that says, listen, you've entered. 
And then over the next few weeks, they're going to receive information to back that incentive up. You've won the incentive or you're entered for the incentive. Now, now come to Woodstock, now visit. Um, and again, what we're solving for here is the 99.9% .9 of this audience, which doesn't win. We're using that 0.1% of the audience that does to bring the rest. And that's worked pretty well in terms of engagement, even after the incentive period is closed. So to recap, John, you can jump to the next slide. Our goal was to build and deploy this framework to communicate directly with prospect visitors, exposing Woodstock, right, and, and events to new audiences. We've defined these four core visitor segments and we've built ads to target those audiences. We've launched a seasonal program to grow and, and nurture the qualified owned lead list. We've captured and evaluated an absolutely enormous amount of data uh, and, and really look to understand what visitors are, are trying to find here and the best channels to activate those visitors. And then finally, we've defined the KPIs, the performance indicators, to really highlight what economic success looks like for this program. How do we know if it's working? Is it working in the ways that we want? Um, are these just numbers on a page or do they have actual outcomes attached? Um, so at this point, I'm gonna jump into the reporting section. Um, I was asked by the, the marketing committee to keep this really, you know, as high level as high level can possibly be. Trust me, he can get really deep in the weeds. <laughs> so, so my hope here is, is just to keep this, you know, again, very top level. Part of our program was also delivering uh, interactive dashboard, which exists in real time. It's accessible uh, by the marketing team uh, here in Woodstock with all of the KPIs, all of the data that we've captured. And we've actually all gone ahead on integrated historical data too. So we can benchmark, for example, 2022 performance versus, or, or even we could benchmark, for example, the first five days of 2023 versus the first five days of 2014 or 2018. So this sort of all-inclusive dashboard gives us a lot of control to understand what these numbers mean. But, um, you know, big picture top of funnel, we've created about 1.3 million impressions uh, within these audiences that we've built market research around. There's about 92,000 ad engagements um, and 320 unique uh, individual discussion threads on meta platforms on, on Facebook um, and, and Instagram specifically. We've seen about 6,000 reactions, about uh, you know, 550 shares, and most importantly, a cost per click of 18 cents. We've, uh, it really is, that's an average of all these campaigns. Um, our best cost per clicks are around 5 cents. And so, what this really looks like is our ability to drive traffic into the funnel uh, that supports all of all of the owned audience, all of the bottom of funnel initiatives that I mentioned. So the cost per click is, is really, think about that as how much it costs to get someone to engage with our town and eventually how much it costs to get someone to visit our town. Um, in terms of the performance reporting, again, top of funnel, very basic. Our qualification data is based on age, location, engagement. We're talking to the top 10% of income earners uh, in this market only. Their core interest is tourism. Their core behavior is frequent travelers. So we're, the only individuals we're actually targeting here are individuals who regularly travel, regularly spend money, and exist at the top 10% of the income bracket. Um, that Digital targeted size is 4.9 to 5.8 million. There is a range um, because what we're looking at here is really just a small collection of the number of signals we actually use to evaluate this. And because of the volume of those signals, we're not able to be precise. But this also means that we're not really in a situation where we're going to outgrow this audience anytime soon, anytime within the next decade, for example, at the current spend. If you were saying, listen, we want to just talk to everyone and you wanted to spend uh, you know, $150,000 a month, you know, that would be a different conversation. But the point is there's a huge amount of supply uh, here. So we have a lot of opportunity to grow. Put this in a, in a sentence, we're, we're taking uh, high net worth people who have money to spend who like to travel uh, and having them come to Woodstock and spend their money here instead of somewhere else. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so in terms of the website performance, th there's a couple uh, slides that we're gonna talk about um, looking at this from different lenses. Overall, our traffic for 22 is actually a 21% growth over the, 20, uh, the 21, um, 2021 rather travel revenge year. Yeah. So while that number may not seem massive, it, it, it's actually a fairly impactful number. Um, we saw some of the highest performance we've seen in years in 2021, entirely organically driven. And our organic number for 2022 is actually significantly lower. 
And so as a result of this program, we've been able to grow spend fairly dramatically. Um, you can see on the right an example of the returning visitors versus new visitors. And so not only are we bringing more new visitors, new eyeballs into the Woodstock environment than old ones, we're actually increasing the, the difference between 2020, 2021 and 2021 and 22, meaning the, the range of new visitors is increasing that ratio. And which is pretty crazy when you think about 2021, because it was a crazy revenge year. We had so many people here, everyone's going to the websites and we've actually beat that this year. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Have you been able to track um, travelers' experience post post uh, visit? See, that's a great question, Joe. So this framework, this this program overall, think about it as a framework. We can use it for. A, a I huge... mean, the reason I ask that question yeah. maybe the information that the business community and the community as a whole can use to improve uh, yeah. and make the business visit more enjoyable? No, like, like I said, it's a great question. It's actually been discussed numerous times. The answer is yes. Um, it has not been implemented. So our, our scope for the last year was to build the program. The program launched in May, at the end of May, actually. So it's really, we're looking at seven months of data here. But you've built this framework, and within that framework, we have an audience. So audience over here, framework over here. What we can do is start to connect all of these objectives with the audience, meaning we could tell the framework, we, we could build a program that, that very simply says, after you visit, how was your experience? It, yet. it has not been done yet, but it's part of the proposal you'll actually see here to, tonight for 2023, because we want to understand, question number one, did you visit Woodstock in 2022? Question number two, do you plan to in 23? And then based on that data, we develop a list of people that visited, and we oh, send those lists. So and, this is approved tonight, right? When would that be implemented? And when would you start learning about their experience here? Well, if this were approved tonight, um, this, this is something that probably takes about 60 days to implement overall. So feasibly, you'd, you'd start to see that performance uh, come through in March. So how, how do you go about getting that information? Yeah. Do you outright ask the people? Or is there a questionnaire? That's, there, there's two steps. The first step we would need to take is to evaluate prospects who actually visited. So we take, we take the, the list overall, all of those segments, and we say, did you visit in 2022? Do you plan to visit in 23? Based on those response, we can tell the program to send a questionnaire that says, how was your experience on a one to five scale rate all of these six items? Then we would take that data and display it in a dashboard. So um, access to food, for example, what was the experience? I would imagine a two, you know, um, long lines, uh, you know, outdoor experience. And so we can start to look at all of this information contextually. We can't do that until we have the framework and that's what we've built. And so now we suddenly have the ability to use this program to grow business, to support events, to help people move here. You know, there's all these other uses because we have an audience. So Charlie, what you're saying is by the spring, you should be able to garner this information. Is that correct? Say it again, Joe. I said by the spring, you should be able to garner some of this information. Garner, yes, that's correct. Absolutely. Um, look at it this way. What we built right now is the foundation. That's a window. So now we're putting the windows in to be able to look at people and, and decide what, you know, how we need to do it and give access to business. Doesn't he? <laughs> that's not was that? Go ahead. You're, no, but you're right. Patrick's absolutely right. It, it is a window. And so within those windows, look, the sky's the limit. I mean, how much money do we want to spend? We've talked about so many incredible ideas. Um, you know, part of one of the initiatives that we were talking about is how to increase chamber membership, for example, to give Beth and her team more operating funds. So uh, allowing, you know, businesses to leverage some of the resources in this framework. And uh, by doing that, they would have to be chamber members. Um, so there, there are all sorts of different initiatives, and we, uh, I believe there's uh, six in this presentation that we sort of highlighted, but there are a number of other ones. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in actually, actually just a moment here. Okay. Um, back to the reporting, uh, bottom of funnel, this is our owned audience growth. Between 2017 and 2021, uh, the town of Woodstock averaged 51 engaged prospects per month. That's, that's the growth number. So 51 new engaged prospects per month. Um, for a total of 3,000 captured prospects. Currently, we put about that number of prospects into the funnel per month. So we've gone from 51 monthly average to around 2,638 monthly average, peaking over 3,000. And in our slower months, um, 
you know, a little bit under 2,500. Charles, I think, you, is, I think you misspoke. You said you put that number in per month. I think you meant you put that number in every 12 hours. No, no, that's that's per month, John. So 51 was the average monthly increase uh, between 2017 and 2021. 2,638 is the average monthly increase in 22 alone. Right. And so you put in 50 every 12 hours rather than every month. Oh, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. You said you, anyway, I think you miss, you got it. <laughs> I got, I think I get your joke. Or, or, or no, 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 no. I, just, I thought you missed, I think maybe I misunderstood. Anyway, I just want to make the point. That I, it, think it, I think, John, I think, I think they just want to know if you were paying attention. <laughs> I, to put this really, <laughs> to put this really simple, we, we started with 3,000 names that they took five years to get. In seven months, we added uh, enough names to bring us to 18,000 plus. And we're continually adding that. And the nice thing about this is that we'll continue to grow and we'll continue to have more names to talk to. 21,000 plus. Yeah, that's correct, John. So you can see at the bottom under the 22 column, the growth in the past seven months alone. So we've been able to substantially grow our own audience and that opens the doors for all of those windows, all of those opportunities, um, which we're talking about in 23. We can jump to the next slide. Uh, so right now, what we're looking at again is bottom of funnel performance. Um, if, you, if you work at all in the industry, you know I think these numbers are probably more impactful than otherwise. Um, the industry benchmark for tourism, travel, and leisure um, is, is about 20% open rate and a click-through rate of about 1.4. In our flows, this is the automation that introduces a prospect to Woodstock. Its job is to really nurture someone who might be interested, who's self-qualified, but who, who may not actually convert. We're seeing a 55% average open rate um, and a 6.35 uh, click through rate, which is substantial. That's a significant number. Um, if we were in the e-commerce space, you know, we'd be buying an island in uh, the Pacific somewhere. Um, on the organic, Chad, is all great information. It really is. And um, but what this says to me is what the work you're doing right now is is primarily to get them here, and you know, to, to do whatever they want to do and what they like doing. But that's why we want to get them here. I really feel and this is my own personal opinion. The most important um, amount of information you get is how did you like it when you were here? When you and what 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 has to be done? Yeah. That, how can we improve? How can we get better so that their experience is great when they you know when they're here and when they leave? I think that's the most important kind of information. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with you slightly and only slightly. What you're saying is absolutely right. We need to know what their experience is, but we got to get them here. Well, you got to get them here, for sure, exactly. Ask them that experience. Right. And we have to get them here in a way we can then communicate to them. So your idea of asking those questions and sending out a survey or whatever is absolutely necessary. And what totally we def definitely want to do, because it's going to only, all it's going to do is, improve, as you said, improve the experience and right. give us the tools we need to know what to improve. Right. And, yeah. and almost more, I think, what they've done so far is figure out who those people are, right? right? So that now we have back and forth communication so that we know who to ask the questions of. That's what we've collected is like, we filled the room with people. Now we can talk to them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mean, getting here is really, in my opinion, it's a, it's a two-part um, solution or a two-part process. Get him here. You're right, Patrick. You got to get him here. But you know what? You want them to come back. And you want them to, when they leave, they talk to the guy next door and say, you know, we were just in Woodstock, and what a great town. We had a great time. It was a great restaurant, a lot of fun, blah, 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 blah. That, I think, is just as important, maybe even more so, than just getting here. I would agree, Joe. Uh, that, that's, you know, in e-commerce, we talk about, you know, the retention rate, right? That's what you're describing here. Look, this slide we're looking at right now, we can really boil this down into a one-liner, and that says people are listening to what we have to say. That's what this tells us. The purpose of this, these metrics here tonight on this specific slide are to say, look, we, we made some educated guesses. We built some audiences that we thought were qualified. And what we're seeing is that they're listening to us. They are listening to what we have to say. So if we say, look, we, uh, if we can apply this to, to any resource we want, whether that's business development, whether that's event promotion, you name it, the audience is engaged, it's listening. Now, 
it didn't it, it doesn't necessarily always look this way look we could run a contest and have everyone under the the moon sign up and say look i'd love to uh i'd love to win a free night at the woodstock inn i'd love to go stay at the blue horse inn woodstock sounds cool but if they don't win they may not listen to us anymore they may not engage with us anymore what we're seeing is that the audience continues to engage month after month after month to what we have to say regardless of the incentive and that tells us that we're talking to the right people so Joe, you're right, it's, it's, it's a process. And right now we're, at, we're like, we built the foundation. Now we've built the audience. Now we can start to talk to the audience and use it how we want. And that's how the purpose of the marketing committee will change from, okay, how do we do this to how do we leverage this? Because we already have it. Exactly. Um, and while we continually build the audience. Uh, the next, the John, next, John, you have a question? Yeah, well, I just have a comment. It's eight o'clock. Uh, we have, we, we have two more items on the agenda. We, we have to get to the TEDx one. So, um, okay. I just want to give you that. Uh, yeah, I can, I can jump through this quickly. Yeah. Uh, John, I think John's saying is kicking up a notch. Yeah, I can yeah. do that. So this slide is really just growth per segment. These are the four core segments, uh, you know, food and shopping being the highest one of those family arts and culture, outdoor activity, you know, following closely, um, there uh, some some other quick just relevant information on that slide that I'll, that I'll point out. Uh, the primary audience age in Woodstock has shifted dramatically uh, in terms of engagements as a result of this program. Um, it's not represented here, but uh, really our largest traffic audiences are in the 35 to 44 age range, followed by the 25 to 34, followed by the 45 to 54. Now what's interesting here is that the 35 to 44 affluent demographic did not even factor into the top half of our engaged audience prior to this program start. And so what we're doing is we're talking to a younger audience, a younger qualified audience. And that's really important as we think about not only who's coming here, but who's going to live here. Uh, who's who's going to come back? Yeah, who's going to want to come back? That's right, Patrick. So let's just, uh, we'll move ahead again. Um, the next slide outlines the estimated economic impact, the most conservative estimated economic impact. According to the state of Vermont, the research they've done and provided, this number would actually be uh, around just under $11 million. And that's because the average economic impact that is estimated by the state for one person is double what we are estimating as the economic impact in Woodstock. Additionally, this data only uh, takes into consideration one couple staying for two nights. It does not account for any families, any kids, um, any sort of outside activity. So the number is likely two to three times um, this in terms of size. This is just what we can attribute again to the program, um, whether it's gas station, uh, snacks downtown, uh, you know, sandwich in Montfair, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all included in this number. Um, you know, I'm just going to turn it over, I think, at this point to Patrick to talk a little bit about the allocation request for next year. To wrap things up, you know, this is not a short-term investment. And like I said at the beginning, you know, we've talked a lot about the marketing initiative. Marketing isn't really an initiative when we're looking at activating a new audience long-term. It's essentially a cost of doing business. Your audience lives in a different environment. We communicate in a different environment and, and we discover in a different environment than we did 20 years ago. And in the last meeting, I you know, brought up a great story. You know, back when I was a kid, people used to come to Woodstock at Foliage every year regardless of the leaves, regardless of the foliage, they just showed up. Nowadays, you can go on the internet, look at the leaf tracker, and it says, listen, you know, it's a bad year for foliage, so people go to Camden, Maine. Uh, we're competing in an environment, whether we choose to or not, that is just fundamentally different. And so the reason why Stowe is synonymous with BT Tourism is because they invested in several programs, made a concerted effort, not for a year, not for two years, but as a long-term goal, and the success of that, pro, that, that program really is the outcome that we see today. So it's built on itself year over year. And I would just encourage the EDC to consider that um, when we're talking about these things, because it's really not a short term, you know, let's try this out and see. Patrick, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, actually, I'm gonna, just to speed things up, John, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so these are some of the uh, additional things that we could potentially do you know, use my metaphor of windows that we can add to the system, uh, including Joe's to capture information and, and learn what, what we need to improve. Uh, and, and literally, this, because we now have uh, a way to talk to people, we can do a lot more things. All right, next, next slide, John. 
Uh, so what we did this year is we, we captured these four categories, uh, but moving forward, we want to definitely look at how do we capture the traffic of people who might want to live here uh, and how do the traffic that might want to build a business here, bring a business. Uh, next slide, John. Okay. This is really kind of you know, what I had said earlier. We basically had looked at these as a multiple different grants, uh, web hosting, web maintenance, social media coordinator, digital marketing program that we set up, uh, collateral uh, and other opportunities that, that happen throughout the year. And what I wanna do is take those multiple grants and put it into one grant. Uh, so next slide, John. Uh, actually you can go to the next one. This is kind of repetitive. All right, so this, this right now is currently uh, kind of the budget of how we see breaking things out. So web, website maintenance, and hosting, uh, Origins does that, uh, that would be 7,200. Smug Mug, we're gonna take the digital assets that we've put together that class four has, has set up. We're gonna create a space for businesses to be able to grab images and video, for media to be able to grab images and video, uh, and then the marketing group will have its version as well. So that now we'll be able to share all those assets that we built uh, over the last year. Uh, Clavio is the system that we use to send the emails out to talk to people. Uh, and it's extremely uh, sophisticated and lets us do all kinds of tracking to be able to do the types of things that Joe was talking about. Uh, the pay-per-click, that's the ads that we do on, on Facebook and any digital advertising at all. Uh, the lead magnet budget, uh, this is to date, we've the inn and several places have been very kind at donating spaces, but we've put some money in for the budget so that we're not always uh, there hand, with our hand out, that we can pay them something, if, if not full cost, you know, uh, some cost. Uh, the restaurant guide, which was wildly successful, uh, at least in my lodging property that we did this year, uh, people loved it. It gave them a way to figure out where to go, where to eat. We want to continue that on a bi-annual basis. So there'll be a one for the summer through fall and then one uh, in the winter through spring. The uh, then social media co coordinator to continue to do what we're doing uh, with Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, posting as well as responding to posts. We get quite a few requests for information and stuff through that channel. Blogs, I think too, Patrick. Uh, and, and, and the blogs, yep. Uh, and then uh, the marketing program strategy, that's, that's a lot of what class four does is all of the, the thinking and perfecting the audiences uh, and managing the whole program. Uh, and we hired them because of their expertise. Uh, and we've done, they've done an amazing job this year uh, on building the audience that we have now and figuring out who, who to talk to. Uh, and that includes, uh, we wanna add video content. The thought here is potentially build some uh, a story about moving to Woodstock, like the idea of a young family moving to Woodstock, tell that story. And one of the things we wanna start doing with video is telling stories because that'll help us to bring people here. Uh, and then the blog production, we wanna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the VT, Woodstock VT website, which has not really been looked at from a content standpoint in a very long time. Uh, and we're going to go through and eliminate blogs that are never looked at uh, and improve on ones that are looked at uh, and create new ones throughout the year that will tie to the uh, marketing program. Uh, and then we have a contingency in there for any opportunities that happen throughout the year, which there are many things or, or things that we have to, that we didn't plan on, that we didn't, couldn't see until we're in the middle of it. Uh, so the whole budget, which I can't see, hold on a second. It's Thank you. Because yeah, one fifty eight six. So that's that's the budget we're looking at. That's the budget we would like to approve. We've taken a, a pencil to this uh, and really sharpened it out and and really cut the fat out of anything that would be there. Uh, so if anybody you know has any questions, fire away. Mary. Um. So. To clarify, this it would be an annual budget now, or is this for a period of time? This this would be for 2023, and then we we'd see where we are at the end of 2023. And but there, moving forward, there needs to be planned for, you know, a, a fairly large budget to continue building the 
the list and, and adding the fun functions and features this like Joe cover, would like. To cover 12 months. Yes. Okay, so two more questions. Um, one is, um, I think there was inquiry at the last presentation about uh, interest in some of the committee members in seeing some of the content. Um, I think that was something that came up and I don't know if that's easy to do, maybe to send something after the meeting or something like that so that we could see that. I know that was a question. Um, and then I know we don't wanna get into the nitty gritty, but I'm sure you've thought about um, when we're spending taxpayer money, who decides or how do we decide which businesses are featured? And that would be an important issue, I think. Well, I think the first criteria there is they would have to be a chamber member. Uh, Charles and I have talked about this and we, we figure we can do two businesses a month. Uh, and I think we'd start sort of a people would, we, you know, we put a form up and they would apply to do it. Uh, and I don't know, we'd have to think about what I we Yeah, I think the way the way we talked about doing that, uh, again, there are a lot of ideas. Like last year when we went into this, we thought, hey, listen, you know, this is beyond tourism. We might want to, how to we get people to move here, buy houses, build houses. So we were like, look, let's work with local brokers and real estate agents. And we ran into the same thing. You know, who's chosen? Why? is So, you know, I'm familiar. The way we probably handle it with businesses is we do an open, an open forum. Uh, what? An open forum. Businesses could go to a URL that we provide. They could request that their event be featured. If there was room, we'd feature it. I would note that it's it's we we can probably feature two per month, but we can also promote as many as we want through the town calendar through other resources like that. Beyond that, there's also an opportunity because we do have a fairly low we call it a frequency the amount of sending. Uh, this is something we've discussed internally to allow a business to essentially like send a message through this that is theirs. And so it's like, listen, I'm, I'm a business. I want to talk to your entire audience. I want to engage. I'm, maybe you're starting a new business in Woodstock, for example, um, for a fee or for free. However, we handle that. You essentially can take one of three slots because we currently have one email a month. We could probably send up to four in this audience. Um, so somebody could just take over an email, an event. I guess that would be, you know, um, I like, I know we have other stuff we want to get to, so I don't want to get into yeah. the nitty gritty. Uh, yeah, I think the important point would be to yeah. just have a process and to just sort of have a committee that yeah. is deciding in a way that feels fair to people. Yeah. The way the way that I've done it with other businesses is you make the business pay a little bit of money and it, that weeds out people quickly. Right. Yeah. So in, when I used to do Amex, it was 25% the, the business, 75% Amex. I and, think, the, you know, we, Patrick, let me just interrupt for a second. I think the purpose yep. isn't to answer the questions tonight. I think because we're yep. not being asked to approve the budget tonight. This is just so. You're right. You're right. Sorry. The right. You'll come back and take Marion's question and come back next month. To yep. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll call everybody. And if you have questions, I'll answer as many as, as I can and get answers if I don't have You've them. You've got my question. <laughs> I, I, I think I'd like, I'd like to hear an answer to that in a few months. Yeah. Sounds good. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, my question, which I mentioned to you, Patrick, before the meeting, was um, we, we spent, you know, 105,000 or 100. Well, we spent about 95, I think, of the 110 on the program building the platform. And so um, I, the I'm just wondering how much of the 77,000, you don't have to answer it now, is building the platform, is expanding the platform versus using the platform. Um, and I just sort of to understand, you know, yeah, understand that again. What the I breakout think, is? Yep. I think we are yeah, going. There's some initiatives there, John. I think. I don't, know, don't answer it now, Charles. Okay. It's, yeah, a question to be it's just going, um, but write the question down, John. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Any I didn't mean to cut you off, Charles. Comments? I just... Any, anybody else that would like to pipe in for any reason whatsoever about this model? <laughs> okay, hearing none. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Thank you. Guys. Thanks, Thank Charles. You. Do we entertain the motion about the budget? No, we're not, we're not voting today. Okay, go ahead. So the next one, as I understand it, is downtown revitalization. There's really nothing to discuss there. Uh, we can go on to EDC uh, initiative updates, community grants. Can somebody speak about that? Yeah, I'll speak John. about that briefly. We have four or five applications. Um, we've promoted it several times. We have our date is April 21st, uh, sorry, January 21st, which is Saturday in two and a half weeks. Um, I, I'm waiting to see the deadline is January 16th. 
so we'll have the applications. The applications are available on the website. There's five or four or five of them. Um, that's sort of the status. We. That, okay. That's it. Thank hey, you, John, John. Quick question: How many last year came in at the last minute, so percentage-wise? A lot. I, I don't remember because we had pre-applications. So oh, right, right. Actually, the other way around. We had fifty-eight, yeah. and then we went down to thirty. So okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the, the next item is revolving loan fund. That is something that John and Larry and I have been interested in, and um, I'm going to let Larry talk about this because he's really been doing the lion's share of the work and 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 uh, like learning that. more about this. So where is Larry? We lost him. No, He's there. Larry. Oh, there he is. There he is. Can you speak to Larry, please, where we're at and how we got there? Well, um, uh, in the, um, oh, there it is. Uh, I, I think what we were planning to do was to um, get some input from the full board on some uh, basic questions that we we had, so we get a, a sense of that um, the way the the board would like us to uh, uh, proceed. And I, my guess is, John, that we probably should put this off to another uh, well, meeting. On, only because, uh, unless Deborah, I mean Deborah, we have already pushed Deborah's after action review as an example of how to do them off already. So I wanted to at least spend the last fifteen minutes on that if we can postpone this. Unless Deborah, you'd rather. Postpone again. Okay, let's, let's, let's do that. Um, Deborah, do you? I, I, I'm either way. I mean, I think it might be good for us to do it just so yeah, I, I we can make decisions on what other people need to do with their reporting. Yeah. But it's but I'm fine if you want to. No, 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 just, no. It's timely. Larry, hey, John, I, I think I think you should go ahead, Deborah, and, and, uh, and then we can. John, quick, I would do afterwards. Quick what? question on the loan fund: Could we do this as a as a uh, something we send out a survey that we answer questions and then we can go over it into our next meeting. Well, you don't know what the answer question is about because that's what was what was going to be presented tonight. Oh, I thought that was the questions there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Larry, it's so completely Deborah, why, up to you. Why, why, why don't way. you go ahead, Deborah? Um, Larry, it's completely up to you. I, mean, I don't want to, you know. Oh no, go, it's no, you you go ahead. I think the the conversation that that I envision anyway is is going to take quite a bit of time, and I yeah, yeah well. that's what I was thinking too. Okay, that's fine. Yahoo, is that all right, John? Yeah. Um, all right, can I get the screen share? Can I? Can Don's I host? Got, Don is doing the screen. I think. Go ahead, Deborah. You have the permission. Yeah, you man. <laughs> John, you sound better tonight. Yeah, I, I, yeah. There it is. Are we seeing it? Yeah, yep, we're seeing it. Yeah, we're seeing it. I can move your faces. Now I'm yawning and making a presentation and I'm yawning. That's not good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, in the conversation that I had with John, I don't know, two months ago now, we were talking about, I wanted to, um, A, as somebody who got a grant, you know, thank EDC and show EDC everything um, that was done and also make sure that you guys, that we all had materials that you could then pull forward to show what EDC has done and what it's about. So we were talking about like coming up with a formula that everybody needs to kind of follow. Um, this one's very visual because it's a visual event and it had assets that maybe other um, grants don't have. But the basic form is these are the things that we're proposing that each of the grants bring forward for us to review, which is A, the use of funds, um, images from the project in whatever way we can so that we can start documenting it and putting on social and putting on our website. Um, reviews of the project when apl applicable, if you have community comments about it or something that then we might be able to use in the future again to show what EDC has done. Um, examples of the EDC logo placement, um, because that's something that we want to again start to um, standardize in a way to make sure that the EDC logo is more forward. Um, I put self assessment. 
just to have some feedback, you know, about how grants worked, uh, what worked and what didn't. Um, and, um, you know, challenges as well, you know, and the next steps, there you go. So there you go. So it, this will not take long, hopefully. Um, the TED talks are finally edited. They were uh, 13 talks. They're very, a lot of material to get through and to edit. Um, I personally, I mean, I, I not, there are a couple people here actually were at the event. There were 13 speakers. Um, I uh, offered each one 10 hours to work with each one in prep, which ended up being a lot more. Um, and then there were hours in, in um, creating it. So I just wanted to show you what the beginning of each TED Talk looked like. Uh, but please start looking at them and getting them out as they come out because um, it's going to be very exciting. Okay. Um, are you nervous? I'm nervous. No. I'm nervous because I do do this frequently, but I usually have a relationship. Uh, so that just gives you an idea of what it looks like, the quality of what it looks like, um, and the beginning, and also the, the placement of our um, title sponsors, including uh, Matt Old Nut, thank you, Todd, and the EDC, <laughs> as well as Billings, so that, um, you know, and again, this comes down to... Um, uh, what we were talking about with Patrick, it puts us out there more, right? Um, this was the EDC logo that we had. It's changed slightly where Economic Development Commission is a little bit larger, uh, which I like better. So I think in the future, we'll have a better one. But the point is, it's going to be on everything and it's going to be written on everything. So that's forward. Uh, some tallies for you. We had 14 speakers, eight of which were from Vermont two from New England and four, four from elsewhere. Um, I felt like that was a good combo. You know, it was like about two thirds, one third, you know, uh, to really build something interesting. Uh, this coming year, I am, I'm putting together a, um, a panel of people that are working with me to do the choosing of the speaking speakers and to kind of share the tasks a little bit more. Um, and I'm also bringing in a strategic development person who is going to be, um, you know, I'm not sure if she's on the license or not, but uh, Marisa um, is coming on board and that's going to be fantastic. Please sign up on our website, which is www.tedxheartlandhill.org. Um, and then if you do that, then immediately when they're live, you can come and see them. This was our topic. What is community? Home, heart, hearth. This was a, a wonderful thing that was done by Ink Factory who listened to all the talks and created this visual of everything that, um, of all the different talks. And uh, we're gonna use this for promotion, which was really cool. It was something that was created as the talks came along. Um, and so that's a pretty cool one. Overall numbers, uh, we had 138 attending. There's 97 seats in the theater a hundred seat in the overflow available. It was interesting. I think um, some of the comments were, you know, I wish we knew more about it ahead of time. You know, there's there's things that we need to adjust as far as getting the news out. And I definitely think we're going to be able to, A, fill to 200 next year and then get to TED and get a larger, um, um, uh, what is it called? Licensing to do more where I'm able to, you know, go to maybe even um, Woodstock Town Hall and create something larger. Um, our grade from Ted, this is from um, audience uh, who uh, uh, attended uh, was 94, which they said was like unheard of. So that's a really great thing um, that the people who attended really liked it. Uh, the overall reach was low, but not too low. 24,000 is not bad for, for what we had put out. Um, and the interaction rate was really high. Um, so this is something where I'm going to be putting some money into this year to get out wider. Uh, here are some of the comments that 
we don't have to go through all now, but I'm going to bring it, give it to all of you because these are things that, again, when we show all the different projects that we've done, you can use these to say this is an event that, you know, was really successful and that the EDC helped start. So um, the comments were really strong. The, one, the couple that were like a um, uh, good suggestion, which was, you know, that there needed to be more interaction between audience members um, and that there needed to be more promotion, both of which I agree. And something to look forward to, we're doing uh, TEDx salons, four TEDx salons leading up to September 23rd this coming year. So those are going to be evenings with three speakers and more interaction um, on different topics. And if any of you have an idea, obviously housing is one that I'm really interested in doing. But if any of you have ideas, please come to me um, because those will be running all during, you know, through the next year. Again, this is an example of how um, we showed, you know, Woodstock EDC and our title sponsors. They were pretty much on everything because they were awesome. Images that you guys can use. Period. Marion took a lot of these images <laughs> and there's Marion there. Hi, Marion. And that's Marisa in the background. And that's her Actually, daughter. Yeah, in front of the camera, Marion. <laughs> <laughs> she was helping me <laughs> stuff the bags. I'll stuff the goodie bags. And there's Jeff. Jeff has an awesome uh, TED talk that's going to come out within a week. So those are some of the images. Larger screen. Um, this was a beautiful event. Thank you so much to Artistry. This was one of the ones that I thought went well. I mean, except that two things that I, I will improve on next year, which is the the break between, uh, this was at in the evening, the break between all of the talks and then going to this performance. It was just so, I mean, the day was so dense that people I think were overwhelmed and we only, you know, were too tired to come all the way there. And there were only 40 people there as opposed to what this woman really deserved. I mean, John, you were there, they were, and, and I think- um, Yeah, she um, was fantastic. Was there too. Yeah, she was amazing. Also, uh, Kathleen Dolan, um, we had gotten extra food and extra, we had uh, purchased TEDx, uh, you know, we had purchased food for all our, our musicians and somehow in the moving from one place to the other, you know, the production staff wasn't there and they, there wasn't any food for them. And I was elsewhere getting something else done. And apparently Kathleen Dolan, you know, got them food, you know, and got everything up and running and as well as offering us the space. So it was really kind of spectacular. So those are, you know, things that we need to adjust. This is um, the economic breakdown of the whole uh, event, um, which shows pretty much all of our, yeah, shows everything that we'd done. Um, I thought it was going to run around 90 and it was 79. Um, EDC was $25,000 grant. Thank you again. That's down here. Uh, the money went specifically into the production in here, this area here, and into promotion. Um, in the future, I think I'm going to be able to get more um, hospitality rooms for housing. So I think that's something that's going to improve. I think we're going to have more in kind uh, and therefore more ticket sales um, involving people with getting advertising, things like that. The shortfall is, is a tough one because I am slowly paying that off myself. Um, but, you know, I think, in, you know, coming, doing something over the next year will put us in a better, you know, an, a better shape for the, for the coming following years. And a lot of the things that we produce, we can reuse that, you know, are not going to be the expenses in the future years. So that's how that breaks down. Thank you very much. Deborah, quick question. Uh, yeah. Are you planning on having it the same time? You know, yes, we went back and forth about it and we are having it at the same time. Um, September 23rd which is two days after the International Peace Day, which is on Thursday the 21st, and there's gonna be events leading up to that. Um, but I think the feedback that I got was, it, need, it we just needed to start marketing earlier yeah. 
and that there were a lot of people, some people also didn't know what Ted, they were like, Ted who? And then other people were like, oh my God, we had a Ted, you know? That's so hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was a little bit of a mix. I also think um, next year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, maybe not 13 speakers, maybe only, you know, 10. So it ends a little earlier. It ends at like four and that the music and the the afternoon thing is right afterwards at the same location. Um, that we still have a morning and an afternoon, but also get it out to um, the hotels and the B and Bs, so people who are coming to town can you know know about it ahead of time and buy either a morning ticket or an afternoon ticket, you know ahead of time. Um, so I I think we're gonna fill. It's going to be a different experience next year, but but again, it, I mean, for those of you who were there, I think every everything that I got as far as feedback was 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 pretty was pretty good. Any other questions, comments, John? Go ahead. Um, thinking about this as a template for, well, sorry, substantively, I was at this event and the music thing and stuff. I thought it was fantastic. Um, it, and it really surprised me. The things that I thought I was going to be bored at, that I was literally going to get up and leave because I was had no interest in. The, there's a a photographer who takes pictures of people doing yoga. I'm not that interested in photography. I'm sorry, Marion. I hate yoga. <laughs> it was fantastic, and we bought one of his paintings, which is now downstairs in our in our basement. It's just it was a great event. But thinking about this as a template for post grant feedback, which is what, partly why Deborah, you know, did this. I I think we're going to I hope we're going to move into a model based on our last hour and a half of discussion where we're not going to be doing all these grants. We're going to be doing a much smaller number of grants. We need to spend more time on each one, but we're not going to for 12 months of the year be doing grant things, we're going to have time to do post grant reviews. And I think in each one, we learn something about what are the kind of things that we should be funding. So I, let's just, just to put the idea on, you know, in our minds to be thinking about over the next few months, because we've talked about this however many times, multiple times, how do we institutionalize with every grant, basically going back and figuring out what worked, what didn't work, and what does that inform us about going forward? So Deborah, thank you for putting this assessment, post action assessment together. And I will also say that the one thing you didn't mention because you took it for granted was that the main objective, as I recall it, for giving this grant was that we wanted to create something that would continue. We didn't say how many people should come, whatever, we just said it should continue and you're planning to have it continue. So at least in the first year we've achieved that objective. Thank you. Yes. Todd, yeah. you got a, you got a, Todd, do you have a question? Yeah, just more of a comment. I mean, I mean, Debbie put on a great event. I mean, there's obviously like a lot that you can learn from it and anybody who puts on an event like that could learn, but it was a great use of town money. And I think, I think it resonates for a long time. And the fact of the video assets and whatnot. I mean, that's sort of the gift that keeps on giving. And Marion did a really great job. I mean, and Marisa there and everybody, it's just like super pro. Um, I'm still, I'm, to make a light joke, I'm still like, where's the plaque about the African-Americans at Vail Field, you know, from a year ago, the reason I voted for that one, you know, sort of yeah. stuff like this. So I think like getting, having, having any template is a good idea but what you just showed was really professional and that was i'm exhausted not as exhausted as joe but that was worth our time and thank you thank you i think the other thing is um for us to have a dropbox for things like this so that there are like the images or any assets from you know from these different um grants are you know you guys have asked you guys us we have access to use on our site or in promotion of the work that edc does so that there's never a question what edc is up to i think you know the more including yeah. the veil field plaque <laughs> yeah but i'd like to say one thing too which is what i love about your doing your tedx is it's not a local event 
it's an, a national slash international event that you've brought to Woodstock. And, you know, as that continues, it's just going to grow and get bigger and even give Woodstock that much more uh, national yeah. exposure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Please, please, thank you. And please do share them when they start coming out. Um, I think, you know, for those who weren't there, they were really powerful. I'm really, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm proud of them and I'm proud of everybody. And I love the fact that, you know, some of our, our locals have TED Talks now that are going to go far, you know, I mean, from community to commune, you know, I mean, that's going to go far, you know, or from commune make, to community. You can know, there's going to be- When, when yeah. you send these out, uh, can you send a little- uh, something that we could post in social media because I would put this on my uh, my site for sure with the links for each one that come out. If you do a little, just a little something we can use to post, it would be great. Yes, it's all going to come out through social media as well as an overall email. So, thank you. Yeah. Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Need a photo. Okay. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was great. Um, what's next? John? I, I think I don't have the agenda up on the screen. Wait, it's, I think that was Yeah, it. that's right. Exactly. That's why I said adjourn. John. <laughs> Ready? I make I John. Second. To adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjourned. Bye.